A welcome also from me, Lena Lindenskov. I'm from this place, DPU Aarhus University, and member of the local committee and the Nordic uh, committee. I'm here to specially welcome Marie Pascal Noel. Um, you have been here before, and uh, it was, uh, you were here yesterday, but you have also been here uh, several times uh, in the last years. Uh, you were here in 2013 and made a plenary here on this uh, scene, and you have also been very helpful for us in the advisory board for uh, some of the local Danish uh, work on developing a test for dyscalculia. We admire your scientific work and we are pleased that you will inform the audience, uh, everyone here, about that. But we also admire your respect for the people that you investigate into and uh, your respect and caring for those children and young people and adults that uh, have problems with mathematics. So we like and we try to learn from your passion for both uh, uh, doing strict uh, scientific uh, work and also care for and give ideas and inspiration for practice. So I warmly welcome you. Please help me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. <laughs> so hello, everyone. When Lena uh, invited me to come here, I said, OK, and I gave her a title of a research that I was doing. And then a few months after, she said, well, you know, could you please do something else like <laughs> Uh, what do we know about this calculia and where should we go from there? And I said yes, but I didn't know it was such a challenge for me. So I will not present specifically my own research. I will give you a broad overview of the research field the way as I perceive it. And, and then I will raise three questions that for me are important. So let's start with the beginning, DSM-5. This calculia is related to difficulties in learning number-related concepts using symbols and functions to perform math calculation. So it can include difficulties in number sense. Now you have all heard about number sense. Memorizing math facts, knowing 5 times 5 is 25 doing math calculation, so a larger, more complex calculation, math reasoning, like for instance, solving word problem. A math reasoning is really like um, also uh, dis discovering the link between one operation and the other, things like that. And these difficulties should, for uh, having the diagnosis, persist for at least six months, despite the provision of specific intervention appear during school age and it can last until adulthood and it interferes with the individual's academic or occupational performance. Of course, when you are dealing with children, it's not a problem of occupational performance. They are just having difficulties in school. They don't have daily difficulties, but when you are in an adulthood, then you really have difficulties from day to day. And these difficulties cannot be explained as a consequence of brain damage or diseases, neurogenetic disorder, premature birth, visual or hearing impairment, intellectual disabilities, or poor psychoeducational stimulation. So I will emphasize the diagnosis as it was a request that I received one week ago. <laughs> So in research, when the research is dealing with dyscalculia, the criteria can be very varied. It can go from a performance below the 35 percentile up to 
uh, performance below the, the second percentile or below three uh, uh, standard deviation, or sometimes you can have also a lag in the school. And sometimes the name associated with it can differ. So what I saw was that if people have not very strict criteria, they will talk more about math learning disabilities. And when you have more strict criteria, people will talk about developmental dyscalculia. Of course, there are also other criteria that I did not uh, um, mention in every case, but usually you have an IQ criteria that can also differ, like uh, in Bugden and Ansari, the IQ must be above 70, whereas uh, in De Carli, it's above 85, so it can be different. And of course, this study, most of these studies exclude uh, people with other uh, problems. And uh, quite recently, uh, there has been a consortium of German experts who, who propose three steps in the diagnosis. The first step um, is to really exclude other explanation for dyscalculia. So if you have a brain damage, if you have a premature birth, if you have a low intelligence, if you have this and this, then it can be not be a pure dyscalculia. If you don't have all these conditions, you have to show that there is a clear evidence of dyscalculia. So you have to show that, for instance, in preschool years, you had already difficulty developing the concept of numbers and quantity maybe problems in naming numbers or the size of quantities, difficulties in counting, in comparing numbers or quantity. These difficulties should be persistent. Uh, in school mathematics, you could have, of course, the problems change. You could have problems with uh, simple arithmetic at the start, then, or problem with place value, problems reading, writing numbers, and so on. And uh, we also examine whether you have a familial clustering of dyscalculia because we know that about half of the family also have uh, learning problems. If you answer yes to this, then these uh, consortium propose that a criteria of performance in math below the percentile 16 is the yes to go for dyscalculia. If you don't have all these criteria, this consortium proposed that you need to have a stricter criteria of minus percentile 7 on the math test. And then the step 3, you have to see whether there are other comorbid disorders. It can be another scholastic developmental disorder like dyslexia, it can be ADHD, it can be um, um, internalizing problems such, such as anxiety, and in particular, math anxiety, or it can also be a problem of external disorder. If you have one of those problems, they say um, it's not dyscalculia, it's a mixed disorder of scholastic skills. If you can answer no to all this question, then finally you can have the diagnosis of dyscalculia. So as a summary, the three steps are uh, those. Is it due to another cause? If yes, it's not dyscalculia. Uh, do you have difficulties from preschool, persistent with a familial clustering? If no, then you, uh, sorry, it's uh, the reverse. If these difficulties are there from the start and so on, then you can use a relaxed criteria of performance below percentile 16. Otherwise, you need the stricter criteria. And if there are other problems uh, at school or in, the, in your behavior and so on, then it's not called dyscalculia, but uh, mixed scholastic uh, problem. So if you need to make a diagnosis, you'll see that you need to have a very large uh, anamnestic and that you need to assess a lot of things. You need to assess the intelligence of the person. 
you need a medical examination to see whether uh, the person is, has no neurological problem, has no vision, hearing problems. And uh, you also know, need a psychological examination to see whether the person has anxiety, depression, and so on. So it's quite complicated. And I have some questions about that. First of all, for instance, they say, in case of prematurity, you don't uh, give the diagnosis of dyscalculia. But I personally know uh, two twins, uh, homozygote twins, and only one of them has very, diff uh, very big problems in learning mathematics. So as this uh, woman is um, born very prematurely, I have to say she doesn't have any dyscalculia, she is just a premature child. But how can I explain that her sister is really fine uh, in terms of cognitive skills, math learning and so on? Can I give her a remediation? Can I get a reimbursement for dyscalculia in that case? I also question the different cutoff depending on the history of the math difficulties. Um, why is it the case? If your family suffer from dyscalculia, you can have just middle difficulties and be diagnosed, and otherwise you need to have very strong difficulties. I'm not sure that I would go with that. And then sometimes I also uh, put into question the fact that there is no dia dyscalculia diagnostic in case of other disorder of scholastic skills. For instance, you can be dyslexic, and then we don't speak about dyscalculia. Uh, we say mixed scholastic disorder, but uh, we know that people with dyscalculia and dyslexia, it's really two additive problems and not interactive. Well, of course, they are playing one with another, but they are really the two causes that are additive rather than interactive. So it's very important to also say that some of the dyscalculic, some of the dyslexic children are also dyscalculic, and it's only half of them. And um, also, uh, no diagnostic of dyscalculia in case, for instance, of ADHD. Uh, of course, if you are a very inattentive child, you can make a lot of destructive errors in your math class. You don't listen so much to the teacher, and so on. But it's very different when you test a child and you see that he can make errors randomly for simple item and complex item, and you have to repeat some instruction twice, and so on, from a child who has really difficulties in very complex item. And actually, you can, s but it's a clinical point of view, uh, you can see whether the attention problem explains most of the errors, or whether it's really uh, a concept misunderstanding that explains the errors. So I think it's, you can sometimes say, OK, the poor performance of the child in math is due to distracting problems. So voila. And in another case, you can really see that there is a dyscalculia. And on the top of that, the child is inattentive. The prevalence, there are several studies of prevalence, and I will present only two of them. The one that I prefer is the one made in Israel, where they tested 3,000 children of 10 years old, and they looked at those who were two years behind uh, the other children, and, uh, but having a normal IQ, and they found that more than 6% of them uh, responded to these two criteria. And in Belgium, another study has been realized in which nearly 4,000 children were tested. Uh, the criteria was that arithmetic performance was at least two standard deviations below the norms. Performance was lower than expected on the basis of general school results and intelligence. And these children were not responsive to remediation at school. And they found with those criteria that more than 7% of the children in third grade met those criteria, and more than 6% in fourth grade. So it's not an uncommon 
problem. It has impact, impact in school performance, of course. Uh, often problems uh, such as higher math anxiety or lower self-esteem. And in adulthood, it's still uh, very present. Um, people with low numeracy have a lower range of working opportunities, usually lower salaries, poor financial well-being. They have less access to internet uh, technology and they have lower performance in numerical daily activities. In that study, they asked several questions to adults with dyscalculia, and they found that they were weaker in the response for a question about time, like, can you tell me for how long we've been doing this interview? About measure, what would be the amount of pasta in a, an average portion? Vigna, maybe an Italian name, I don't know. <laughs> General semantic numerical knowledge, like do you remember the dates of the last world war? And money, if a shirt normally costs 50 euros, but you have a discount of 10%, how much is now the price? And I would like to give you some testimony because I think it's very important. One of them, I've never been good with numbers, but uh, being articulate and an excellent reader, it was dismissed as me being lazy or disruptive. From the age of six, when I stood stuttering and red-faced, yet again unable to recite my three times table, and the class genius was invited to smugly recite his 13 times table immediately after to show how easy it was, I thought sometimes wasn't right. Not only was it not right, it wasn't really fair. Hot tears would run down my cheeks and I'd creep away feeling stupid, angry, miserable and very, very alone. Another 26 years old woman. When I was in secondary two, so about 14 years old, they agreed to let me pass on condition that I never studied math. I couldn't calculate what the cashier gave me back, so I never dared to do a student job. I don't manage my budget very well, or I have to write everything down. Another 23 years old. In secondary school, I had a teacher who was not at all supportive and who openly mocked my difficulties, which contributed to my feeling even worse about it. So these difficulties are persistent. Um, in the study, the Israel studies I talked to you about, they um, uh, recontacted the children with MLD six years after, and they found that still half of them were performing below percentile five in a math test, and nearly all of them were performing uh, in the lower quarter of the math test. And uh, we also know uh, that uh, um, there are quite a lot of adults who are below the level one on a one to five uh, scale in terms of uh, mathematics, in terms of numer numeracy. And it varies a lot from country to country, but uh, like in the States, it's 33 percent, so it's really a mass. We also know that children with difficulties in, uh, in terms of dyscalculia, they have uh, difficulties even in very basic numerical tasks. So we don't need to go into very complex word problem solving or mental calculation of two digit by two digit. Even very simple task is already a problem. So, for instance, in seven years old, when you measure the ability to recite the counting sequence, they are slower. Enumeration of sets, they are slower, they have weaker understanding of the underlying principle. It was a study by David Gary. They are uh, sometimes unable to read and write numbers. Positioning number on a number line, uh, they are less precise. Uh, if you present them one digit calculation, they are doing more errors, they are slower, they have less mature strategies. In subitizing, uh, so when you present a collection like here, the four dots, 
normally if you flash the, that collection for a few milliseconds, you are able to give a precise answer, but uh, it has been found that they have a smaller subitizing range, and when they are asked to compare the magnitude of two numbers, and it can be just single digit numbers, they are slower and less accurate. And we know that these difficulties actually remain even in adulthood. Uh, Kaufman said affected children do not grow out of dyscalculia. Um, it has been shown that adults with dyscalculia have a smaller subitizing range, have difficulties in number magnitude comparison, uh, again single digit numbers, have a reduced troop effect when comparing the physical size of the digits. So you present them one small and one big digit, and you ask them to say which one is bigger in terms of physical size. And then you look how much the people are, uh, their performance are interfered by the magnitude size. If the magnitude size is processed automatically, it should interfere. And when the the stimuli are incongruent in terms of physical size and magnitude, then they should be slowed down. And if it's not the case or less the case, it means that the number magnitude is activated less automatically. They also have difficulties with basic arithmetical concepts, such as the base 10 system, calculating with decimals and fractions. We also know that there are brain peculiarities in uh, dyscalculic. Children with dyscalculia show um, difference in brain structure. In particular, they have less gray matter in the posterior parietal cortex. So it's on the top over there, and particularly in the IPS region, which is a um, intraparietal sulcus around here on both sides. It's a region that is always activated when you ask a subject to do, a participant to do something with numbers. Uh, also less gray matter in the prefrontal cortex and in the hippocampal area, HC over there below, so it's a, a structure that is involved in uh, memory. Um, the brain connection is also different. We have a weak connection between the prefrontal cortex and the posterior parietal cortex. It's the pink uh, link that you can see on the top over there. This um, connection is really a connection that uh, relates two parts of the brain that are important whenever you have to do calculation, for instance. And when you ask them to uh, do some numerical task in the machine and you measure the activity of the brain, then uh, usually we see less brain activity in the IPS, this brain region that is activated whenever you do um, number processing. And this has been seen when comparing non-symbolic um, numerosity, so dot sets, symbolic comparison, so comparison of Arabic digits. And also sometimes in task, uh, you can see uh, increased brain activity in the frontoparietal network. And this has been um, often interpreted in terms of compensatory mechanism that uh, would recruit more working memory and control processes. And often in the study also, we see that in normal children, the frontoparietal uh, network uh, activation level is varying according to the difficulty of the task, with higher activation when the task is more complex. And in this calculia, often you don't find those modulation, maybe as all the task is very complex. We also know now that uh, these brain peculiarities are persistent. In the study of McCaskey, they uh, measured the structural, um, the, the brain structure in children with uh, MLD, math learning disabilities. 
they and they followed um, these children for four years and uh, remeasured the the brain structure, and they found uh, the reduced grade matter volume in the parietal lobe. Uh, you can find it for instance, where I put the two blue arrows, uh, also in temporal and frontal parts, and they also have reduced white matter volume, so uh, more connections in the tracts, especially in the frontoparietal uh, tracts that you can see on red here. We also know that uh, developmental dyscalculia is a problem with comorbidities, and I mean it's not the only one. All neurodevelopmental disorders are characterized by the fact that they have uh, uh, comorbidities. It's really a characteristic of all of them. Uh, comorbidity with dyslexia, about half of the dyscalculic children are poor readers, not that it's also the same for dyslexia. Half of the dyslexic children are dyscalculic. Uh, ADHD, about 25% of the children uh, with dyscalculia have attentional problem. Uh, the SOOT uh, measure a uh, rate of 42%. And uh, Ashkenazi uh, measured uh, the attentional function of uh, adults with uh, developmental dyscalculia and showed that they had problems in the attentional network. And then there is also a relationship with matanxiety. Matanxiety is the fact that any time you know that you will be doing math, being tested on math, having to calculate something, then you feel uh, anxiety, tension. Koshian said that children with dyscalculia have more math anxiety than typical children. Then Devin said that they are twice as likely to have a high math uh, anxiety. But not all children with dyscalculia have math anxiety. And also, 77% uh, of children with high math anxiety have typical or high mathematic performance. So this is not a novel up between the two concepts. We also know that uh, there are several uh, general cognitive weakness that can be observed when we compare a group of dyscalculic with a group of children uh, with typical performance. We know that they have weaker abilities in working memory, in language abilities, in attention, in executive function. Just to give a taste, this is a systematic review made by Agostini. They measure how many studies, for instance, showed um, uh, lower processing speed in studies who compared children with math uh, difficulties and, and controlled children. And you can see that 17 out of the 22 studies showed lower processing speed. There are also many studies showing short-term ver verbal uh, memory difficulties attention difficulties, working, mem working memory, both verbal and visuospatial, inhibition, cognitive flexibility. So there are a lot of studies showing that as a group, they are um, showing lower performance in several cognitive domains. So in summary, what do we know since uh, all this research? It's Prevalence of about 6%. It's a persistent problem. Difficulties even in very basic numerical skills associated with brain peculiarities. There are comorbidities with other neurodevelopmental disorders, and they are characterized by lower abilities in other general cognitive skills as a group. And now I would like to raise three questions. The first one is, what is the basic number deficit? What is the root of developmental dyscalculia? Is, is there like a first stone in the learning on which all the other learning would be built and that this stone would not be very efficient? The first idea came from the fact that we know that babies 
already have like proto numerical skills. If you present babies with a set of dots, a set of dots, set of dots, and they are always the same, always the same, always the same. If you present a different set of dots, they will react. They will see the difference if the two dots, the two sets are really distant. So this mechanism is called the approximate number sense because children react to the difference in numerosity only if the two sets are very different. If you present 16, 16, 16, 16, and then 8, they react. But if you present 16, 16, 16, 12, they don't react. So it's very approximate. And so the first idea that came from Anna Wilson and Stanislas Dehaene was that this system that allows you to make the difference between two collections without counting, and which relies on the approximate number system, that would be the root of this calculia. Uh, in support of that AI hypothesis, uh, the team of uh, Alberta uh, tested 14 years old children, uh, some of them with MLD, and they presented them collections of dots, yellow and blue dots. They flashed the collection so that the child could not count, so that they would use their approximate number system, and they measured the, the degree of precision of that system. How close can uh, the two collections be so that you are still able to make the difference between the larger and the smaller? And what they found is that the, precision, the degree of imprecision in that type of task was significantly higher in the group of children with MLD. But in another study uh, that we did with Laurence Roussel, was, uh, we presented um, stimuli collection also, but, and we had stimuli that were very simple, like those on the top, very simple. Why? Because here you can see that there are many confounds with numerosity. The larger collection also has a larger contour. If you calculate the black area, it has more black, whereas on the here below, the collection are much more difficult to discriminate because they differ in terms of number, but the envelope is the same, the black area is the same, the smaller dots is the same, the larger stick is the same, so you really need to extract numerosity and it's more difficult. And in that study, we compared 45 dyscalculic children, 45 control, same age, same sex, same IQ. And what we found was that when we use collection like that, we did not find any difference between the dyscalculic children in pink and the typical achieving children in blue. But when we presented them with two digits, to Arabic digits and ask them to select the bigger one, then we could really see a big difference. So from that, we said, no, 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 there is no problem in the INS. The real problem of the dyscalculic is really to access the meaning, the magnitude from symbolic numbers. But then there were a lot of studies uh, trying to, to see whether what kind of problem do this calculic have? And um, I published a synthesis of that in, uh, with Laurence Roussel, and then I updated this table. And so there are studies who have compared the um, discalculic and controlled children when they are presented with two single digit Arabic, and they have to select the larger one. And there, oof, it's a relief, we are all agree, we all find that they are slower and they have difficulties in that. But we don't find similar results when we present uh, them with collections and they have to approximate the magnitude and select the bigger collection. So it's true, the results are not the same in the literature. But when we look at uh, this slide, I ranked the, um, the studies according to the age of children. And it seems that when you are studying younger children, there is no difficulty when they are 
when they have to compare dots. Difficulties appear when you have older students. So the first deficit does not seem to appear when they have to deal with collection. And if the hypothesis was that the first root of math learning that was deficient was the ANS, the approximate number system, you should actually see that the first deficit should be on the collection comparison. So from that, there are two hypotheses. The first hypothesis is the one that was proposed by Stanislas Dehaene. You see collection, you activate your approximate number system, and based on this approximate number system that we have from the start, from when we are babies, you learn the meaning of Arabic digits and you learn to do calculation. This is called the scaffolding hypothesis. This is the ANS is the basis and from that you put all your math architecture. And with uh, Laurence Roussel, I propose the refinement hypothesis. We say, of course, as a baby, we have an approximate number system. But there are developmental studies which show that this system does not help you in understanding the number magnitude of words. The first numbers that you learn is not Arabic digit, it's words. Actually, when you learn, uh, when you have to give, give me three apples, you need to understand what means three. It's not, these are three apples, it can be five, it can be six. No, I need three apples. So what you need to create is a precise number representation. We are not animals, we are using symbolic numbers. Symbolic numbers help us to go beyond approximate number system and develop a precise number system. So we are saying that this is the problem of dyscalculic children. They have difficulties learning a precise number system. But we are going beyond that. We are saying that when you develop a precise number system, when you use it because you speak about numbers, because you calculate, because you give three apples, because you receive two, exactly two apples and so on, it will have an impact on your approximate number system. It will improve that system. It will increase the precision of that system. This is why I call this hypothesis the refinement. And I came with that idea because, as you can see, at the first, they don't have a problem. But for the other, pro the other children, um, but the problem comes later on. So there is this debate between uh, the two options. And there have been some study uh, trying to test these two hypotheses. For instance, Lowe and collaborator, they tested a lot of children, the five years old children, and they tested them with dot comparison, so trying to measure the precision of the approximate number system, Arabic number comparison, and then mixed comparison skills when the children had to uh, compare a collection and uh, an Arabic digits. They measured this over three time point and they measured math achievement over four times point. And what they found is that early symbolic number ability, so Arabic number comparison, was the stronger predictor of later precision of the approximate number system and arithmetic, and not the other way around. So if you're good in mastering symbolic numbers, then you increase your precision of the approximate number system. But the approximate number system has no impact on your math skills and your ability to process uh, symbolic numbers. So these results are consistent with the refinement account. Uh, maybe I should... Uh, so the idea uh, is really that if you are bad in symbolic numbers, you don't refine your approximate number system. The other children, they are good in symbolic numbers and they refine their approximate number. 
So of course we started at the same level basically, but they improve and I don't improve in my approximate number system. And that's why afterwards I see difference in the approximate system. The second, the second study uh, has been realized by Suarez Pellicini. They tested 38 children uh, between 10 and 13, and they made a very sophisticated research. They asked children to uh, compare the magnitude of two dots while they were in the ERM. So they measured the brain activation while they were comparing two dot sets. And they were specifically looking at what happens in those IPS, those brain regions that are specific to numbers. They also uh, measure their ability to do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and so on. What they found is that uh, the performance in dot comparison, but also a very precise measure of the brain activation during that time, at 10 years old, it did not predict math skills at 13 years old. So although they looked very precisely, even in this specific brain region, it has no predictive power of math afterwards. But math skills at 10 years old predicts both performance and brain activation in the dot comparison later on. So it's not uh, the INS that would promote your learning skills, it's the other way around. It's your learning, your abilities to process, manipulate symbolic numbers that will lead to change in the precision of your approximate number system, including the, your, the activation of your brain when you are comparing those two collections. So symbolic math abilities as an impact on your approximate number system. So although this is still a debate, is it a problem of the INS, the dyscalculia, or is it a problem in accessing the number magnitude for symbolic numbers? How do these two deficits uh, interact with one another developmentally? Well, currently data are according to me, are in favor of the refinement account. There are also very beautiful studies with the Munduruku uh, uh, people living in Brazil, but I will not go into detail. The second question I would like to raise is the question of the subtypes of this calculia. There have been several attempts because people feel and know when they are uh, uh, working with people with dyscalculia that the profiles can be very different. So they try to make subtypes. And there have been several studies using cluster analysis. So you present with people a lot of different numerical tasks and then you make a statistical analysis to find the groups. This is an example, Von Aster, who present all these tasks to um, eight, 10 years old children with learning disabilities, and they find three uh, profiles. The first profile is called the verbal subtype. They have difficulties in counting. They fail to use counting procedure to perform mental calculation. And many of them had also reading and spelling difficulties, and half of them were ADHD. Then they have the Arabic subtype. There were difficulties in reading and writing Arabic numbers, difficulties in number comparison, but half of them had German as a second language. And you know that in German, the decade and the unit are reversed. They don't say 58, but they say 8 and 50. So this can explain many things. And then they have the pervasive subtype, where, as you can see, they have several problems nearly everywhere. And um, mm, most of them also had reading and spelling difficulties, and a lot of them also had behavioral and emotional problems, including ADHD. There was the, a recent uh, other attempt to make subtype of dyscalculia. Um, in this study, they started with a very big group of children, age six, 
they followed them for four, um, to fourth grade, from preschool to fourth grade. They identified 99 children with MLD based on their trajectory of arithmetical fluency, so their speed to um, answer a simple arithmetic uh, calculation. And then they had uh, given to these children three tasks when they were uh, six years old. One counting, for instance, uh, count uh, from six to 13, basic arithmetic concepts such as please draw one more ball than the balls in the picture, number numerosity mapping, so for instance, draw as many balls as the Arabic numeral represented. And from there, they decide whether the child was successful in the task or failed each of the task. And they reported five subtype uh, from this analysis. Uh, 40 children had no deficit at all, but they were declared MLD because uh, actually they had a problem in arithmetic fluency uh, in grade four. So they called this subtype arithmetic fluency deficit. 22 children had deficit in counting only, so they called them counting deficit subtype. Eight children had deficit in counting and number, numerosity mapping, they call them symbolic deficit subtype. Another group, difficulties in counting and basic arithmetic concept, they call them counting and concept deficit. And then deficit in all trees, they call them the pervasive deficit subtypes. So you can already see that there are quite some difference between the first cluster analysis and this one. And then they try to see whether there are other cognitive skills associated to each of these profiles. They found that those who were perfect in the grade, when they were six years old, but they had only arithmetical fluency problem in grade four, they had higher scores in arithmetic reasoning tests in grade four than the other group, which is not a surprise. Those with the counting deficit, they had weaker visual uh, Special, special visualization. They said maybe when you count object, you need to, to, to use your finger to uh, keep track of the object in the special layout. For the two others that did not find something very significant, but for the pervasive uh, subtype, they uh, showed they were having weaker language, language skills. And I will not uh, show you other studies of the same types because it's really a mess, actually. And Shalef and Von Aster have a good conclusion. They said subtyping had not yielded consistent domain-specific difference among children with dyscalculia and has not proven to be useful in understanding or treating the disorder. So really, it's, it's not leading anywhere. We have very different profiles obtained according to the, the measure that were included. Uh, and it doesn't help us to see what are the mechanisms underlying the different profile of dyscalculia. But I would like to present you um, uh, the a type of work that I made with Alice de Vicher. Uh, we started with uh, learning a woman. She was uh, 43 years old. She was very intelligent. She had an IQ above uh, 120. And she said, I have always been in difficulty in, uh, in uh, answering the simple calculation. Like if I'm asked six, six times uh, four, it's very difficult for me to answer that question. And I've been drilling myself and so on for hours and it doesn't help. And I don't know what's wrong with me. And uh, we made a lot of measures of all different kinds. We met her several times and we could, uh, from that, we, um, find out that this person had an hypersensitivity to interference in memory. We know that our memory is associative and um, the problem is that when you have things that are related, they're connected into your memory. 
And when you have to learn arithmetical facts, they are all facts uh, connecting the same digits all to, together. And it's very difficult to have really separate um, memory trace of uh, these different association, F especially for people who are very sensitive to interference in memory. So this was the hypothesis we came um, with after studying this woman, but then we wanted to test whether this was true for other population. So we made another study with grade four children and we distinguished those who were who were uh, able to um, solve uh, easily single digit arithmetic problems and those who had a hard time solving single digit problems, especially multiplication and addition. And we measured their sensitivity to interference in memory and we found that those who had difficulties storing in memory the arithmetical facts were those who were very sensitive to interference in memory. So then we wanted to see, is it the case for all dyscalculic? And uh, here, is, here I'm coming with the subtypes. We measured adults with developmental dyscalculia with two tests, a test of arithmetical fluency. So you give list of simple calculation. In one minute, they have to fill it uh, as much as they can. And then you can see their level of arithmetical fluency. And we also had a very large uh, math uh, battery with problem solving fraction and all kinds of different things. And from that, we could actually distinguish the two types of uh, two groups in the population. The global dyscalculia group was uh, made of adults who were performing below percentile seven on the global math test. They were also um, not very good in the arithmetical fact fluency, but they had like difficulties everywhere. So we call them global developmental dyscalculia. But also half of the group, they were good in the global math test. They were uh, below, uh, above uh, the percentile 30. Um, of course, they were all very good in the Raven uh, mattress. And these people had very specific difficulties in the arithmetical facts. So we compared two subgroup of this calculic adults, those with specific difficulties in arithmetical fact fluency, they cannot calculate, and those who have problems everywhere. And we ask them to uh, memorize a sequence, non-significant, of syllables. So they are, they are presented with mu, pe, ko, wu, na, fi, ze, li, da. And then they are presented with the screen and they have to select the syllable in the right order. So it's a memory task. So they are doing that every time with different sequences. But what they don't know is that there are two sequences that are repeated several times in the experiment. So it's both a short-term memory task, but it's also a long-term memory task. And there are two of these sequences. One sequence is made of the same syllable as the fillers, the fillers, the sequence that are changing every time. So this is called the interfering sequence, because you have to learn a sequence that is always the same, but you see the same syllables that are presented in varied order, mixed with it. And then there is another repeated sequence that is made of totally different syllables. So we call it non-interfering sequence. Here is a graph with the uh, comparison between the learning of the interfering se repeated sequence and the non-interfering repeated sequence. As you can see, the controls, they don't care. They're good in learning these two sequences, and it doesn't matter for them whether they are made of the same syllables as the fillers or not. 
But as you can see, for the dyscalculic with a problem in the arithmetic effect, they're very sensitive to that. For them, they're as good as control when the sequence is not interfering, but when the sequence is interfering, it's very hard for them to learn it. So again, we show that for people who have difficulties learning arithmetical facts, they have a very high sensitivity to interference in memory. Those who have global difficulties, they are poor in the two sequence. And then with one of the sequence, we ask them, you remember that sequence? If I give you mu, the syllable mu, what's the next syllable? Or what's the two next syllable, two step ahead? So we ask them to walk, I would say, in the sequence. And again, here you can see that the, in this exercise, the global dyscalculia they are much poorer, they are producing much more errors than the others. So they really have a problem in storing a sequence in order. So this study allowed us to really show that there are two very different profiles. You have a profiles of people with arithmetical effect deficits only, and these people they have a very hypersensitivity to interference in memory that can really explain why this is so difficult for them to establish clear different traces between each problem and the solution. It always makes a mess in their head. And then you have those people with global deficit who have memory problem in general, and, in spe and here specifically memory of order because they had to remember the sequence in a specific order. So we know that uh, the profile of person with uh, dyscalculia can be quite different. Today there is no clear categorization of this profile nor of the underlying mechanism. And I think uh, that this study that we made with Alice de Fischer is a first attempt in a good direction, where we could really see two different profiles, the underlying mechanism, and uh, it also helps to build specific intervention programs. Because, like for instance, there have been two studies of single case where they try to design to um, to to see how can you learn the arithmetical facts for someone who has this hypersensitivity to interference. The third question, my last question, is about is there a difference between dyscalculia and math learning disabilities? People talk also about primary and secondary dyscalculia. So for instance, Rubinstein and Hennig, they differentiate between Developmental dyscalculia, for them, the primary disability would be caused by core deficit in numerical magnitude representation related to the parietal lobe dysfunction. And then they distinguish it from the mathematical learning disabilities. There would be a secondary deficiency in mathematics due to general cognitive impairment, such as inattention, working memory deficit, so it would be related to uh, frontal lobe dysfunction. Kaufman also differentiated between primary and secondary dyscalculia, with the later, the secondary, being entirely caused by non-numerical impairment. So she said different factors can lead to MLD, such ADHD, working memory problem, emotional problems, but this is not dyscalculia as the core number sense is preserved. Is it clear? Uh, we know that uh, treating ADHD and math anxiety can improve uh, performance in mathematics. So it's true that if you see that kind of profile, it's important to um, get the give the, the help uh, as you can. Yet, sometimes an impairment in a general cognitive skills can lead to a very specific disability in the math domain. That's exactly the case of the patient I was studying. 
she was very intelligent. She had no problem in general memory. When, you, when we used the global test, it's only when we developed tests with a lot of interference in memory that we could see that she had a problem. She had a perfect IQ, more than 120. She had no attentional problem nor anything, but still she had math difficulties, specifically on arithmetic. Okay. So in this case, an hypersensitivity to interference in memory leads to a very specific cognitive impairment that could be seen only in the math field, not elsewhere. Can we call it dyscalculia or not? According to me, yes. This is a specific profile of dyscalculia, even if it's caused by a general problem. This is my point of view. Second, dyscalculia would be the primary dyscalculia caused by a core deficit in numerical magnitude representation. Is it true? The first problem is that clinicians usually do not have accurate measurement tool to measure the number magnitude representation because the difference that you see between groups is a difference in terms of a few milliseconds in speed. So you need to measure the performance on a computer and it's not because we see that two groups are different that everyone in this group is lower than everyone in this group. And there are also some problems. Let's see what uh, Bugden and Ansari did. When you measure the um, precision of the approximate number system, you are presenting sets of dots and people very quickly, and people have to select the larger one. But when you see a collection like the first one, you can see that it's quite easy because actually the external envelope of the collection is bigger for the bigger collection than for the smaller collection. And also the size of the dots is bigger. So that's very easy. You don't need to go to magnitude of number. You can just compare area. Whereas in, those two co in this collection, it's exactly the same number, 21 and 26. It's more difficult because the contour of the uh, first collection is Actually, the, the contour of the smaller collection is bigger than the contour of the larger collection, and the dot size are also uh, smaller. What they found was that if you present those tasks with congruent and incongruent trials with children, uh, to children with math difficulties, what you can see is that there is a difference between typical children, they are in black, and uh, dyscalculic children, they are in gray. You only see a difference in the case of incongruent trials. And actually, uh, you see that for the dyscalculic children, the congruent and the incongruent, they really behave differently with those two types of stimuli, whereas the typical children they are less influenced by those two types of stimuli. So they discovered that uh, it's only when the trials are incongruent that dyscalculic children have difficulties. So it's only when they have to say, oh, the envelope, is, the envelope and the dot size is leading me to an incorrect response, I need to inhibit my response that they show difficulties. So in that case, if in the task they have poorer performance, is it due, is it showing that they have dyscalculia or is it showing that they have a difficulty in task where inhibition is taking place? So a core deficit in numerical magnitude representation could actually reflect a difficulty in resisting to the influence of irrelevant dimension, such as dot size, external envelope of the collection, 
and thus not a number difficulty. Secondly, I would like to mention some studies that I did uh, with Virginie Crollen. And it's related to the fact that the number magnitude system is supposed to be spatially oriented. And in our culture, we have the small numbers on the left and the right numbers on the, uh, and the large numbers on the right. There have been hundreds of studies about this spatial orientation. They're called the SNARK, and I will not go into detail of that, so just believe me. And uh, so we, want, we, we tested children who were diagnosed with a visual spatial impairment, so are, they're not good in copying drawings. When you uh, give them the block test, uh, the, or the block or the cube test of the whisk, they're really poor. So these children they have visual spatial difficulties. And we were wondering if they have visual spatial difficulties, what happens to their number magnitude as this is supposed to be a spatially oriented uh, representation. So we compared 15 of these children diagnosed with visual spatial impairment and 15 typical children. They were about 10 years old. We, pro we proposed them a line and asked them to position a number on the line. And we measure the difference between their answer and the real measure. And what we found was that they were much less precise than the typical children. We also um, showed them two Arabic digits, asking them to select the bigger. And we found that they were less precise and Gomez and Piazza, who did a research very similar to ours in the same time, they found exactly the same results. We um, tried to find indication of the spatial orientation of their number line, their number magnitude system. We could find several indications of that for the typical children, but for the children with visuospatial impairment, we could not find any signs of that spatial orientation. Gomez, Piazza, uh, they proposed dot sets to these children to measure the acuity of the, their approximate number system. And they found that they were less precise. So what we see is that children who have a diagnosis of visual spatial impairment, actually they show all kinds of features that show that their core number magnitude system is deficient, is impaired. So in this case, what do you say? Do you say this is dyscalculia or do you say this is visual spatial impairment? Do you say it's a secondary dyscalculia due to visual spatial impairment? But you just said when it's a core number deficit, it's the primary dyscalculia. So what do you say at the end? So primary, secondary, well, Secondary, it's true that in some cases, general cognitive factors may lead to secondary math difficulties. If you have a poor performance in a math test and you can see that it's only inattentive errors going randomly or more at the end of your uh, session, then you could say, OK, there is no problem in mathematics. It's just a problem of attention. But in other case, some very specific cognitive skills disorder may lead to a very specific impairment just in the mathematic and in one numerical domain. That's the case of hypersensitivity to interference and arithmetic fact developmental dyscalculia. So I think that in some case, what would be called secondary dyscalculia is not a secondary dyscalculia. What about primary dyscalculia? We have seen that difficulties in collection comparison, which is a measure of the approximate number system, can be due to difficulties in inhibition. So is it a primary dyscalculia in that case? Or secondary to inhibition? Is it just an inhibition problem? And we also see that when you have visual spatial impairment, you can have, as a consequence, a difficulty in the number magnitude system. So I would say in that case, it's more a secondary 
uh, dyscalculia rather than a primary. So these distinctions are still far from clear now. So what will be my global conclusion? Um, most of the research about dyscalculia has been made those last 40 years. We have pointed out three questions that will need further research. The first one is, what is the core number deficit? There are still people um, arguing in favor of the hypothesis of the scaffolding. Uh, that is, that the INS would be the primary deficit. I think that there are more proofs uh, for the refinement hypothesis. So the deficit would be accessing the magnitude of symbolic numbers would be the first deficit. And then it would have consequence, including on the ANS. The second question is, are there different subtypes of dyscalculia? Yes, I think there are different subtypes, but now we still don't know what they are. And I would say that maybe we have a, a very specific subtype uh, for specific difficulties in arithmetical facts and maybe another more general one, or maybe several ones. Can we differentiate between primary and secondary dyscalculia? I think that now, absolutely not. And I would say maybe as a clinician, sometimes we can do a difference. Maybe sometimes we can say, OK, there are different, dif there are a variety of difficulties, but my hypothesis would be that the math difficulties are just a consequence of something else. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your talk. I think you gave us um, a possibility to look uh, into the research kitchen at a very high level. Um, the kitchen that uh, provides us, all of us, uh, some nourishment, some food that uh, can uh, help us uh, to develop, to develop uh, the specific aspect of mathematic difficulties that we are working in. You showed us um, your own creativity in uh, developing, creating uh, hypotheses and uh, how you try to test them in different ways. And uh, you also gave us uh, uh, a view, your view, about uh, how, how, how the present uh, state was, is right now. On there are so many things about dyscalculia going on around the world, and uh, I think it's very important for us to, to be aware of some of it. And mm. as my question to you, not Recent, very recently, about that, uh, uh, it is difficult for us to, when we read articles uh, because many of the articles we read, they do not precisely give us insight into what is their definition and what are they build, they, they, what are they building upon. So, thank you very much. We have the possibility of, you, you will stay here for the rest of the conference, and it will be possible to talk to you. But thank you very much again. Thank you.